Unplugged in, it's happening again. Another military coup in the nation of Myanmar, putting the country's nearly 10-year democracy experiment on hold. Illegitimate government leads to instability. You're seeing that now in the streets. Nobel Peace Laureate Aung San Suu Kyi is detained, along with hundreds of her political allies. The Burmese military should relinquish power they have seized. And what of the Rohingya, massacred and made homeless by Myanmar's military? Unplugged in, Myanmar, democracy in peril. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren, reporting from Washington, D.C. Another setback in Myanmar for democracy with another military coup. On February 1st, the military took control of the Southeast Asian country, declaring a one-year state of emergency. The military claiming the government did not act on claims of voter fraud during November's elections, where results showed an overwhelming win by the party led by Aung San Suu Kyi. She and top officials from the National League for Democracy are under house arrest. This detention putting in jeopardy Myanmar's experiment with democracy that began with Suu Kyi's release from house arrest about 10 years ago. Before that, the country, also known as Burma, was among the world's most repressive. Brutal crackdowns on dissent in 1988 and 2007 marked nearly 50 years under military rule. What started as the banging of pots and pans in protest of the coup spilled into the streets as police used water cannons to disperse relatively peaceful protesters. Coup leaders threaten unspecified action will be taken if the demonstrations continue. World reaction to the coup has been swift. Australia, the European Union, and Great Britain have condemned the takeover. The United Nations Secretary General called it a serious blow to democratic reforms. China, however, blocked the UN Security Council statement of condemnation and instead urged the sides to properly handle their differences. The United States has denounced the coup and is reviewing American assistance to the Myanmar government. More from VOA diplomatic correspondent Cindy Sain. The arrest by Myanmar's military of civilian leaders and members of parliament has prompted an unusually swift reaction in the form of a weighty legal determination by the U.S. State Department. After a review of all the facts, we have assessed that the Burmese military's actions on February 1st, having deposed the duly elected head of government, constituted a military coup d'etat. Price told reporters the designation triggers a review of the $135 million of U.S. aid to Myanmar, though very little of that goes to the government, and assistance to the Rohingya ethnic minority will not be affected. Myanmar's military has refused to accept the results of November elections won by the National League for Democracy, alleging massive fraud, and declared a one-year state of emergency in the struggling democracy. On Capitol Hill, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell praised the Biden administration for consulting congressional leaders on Myanmar and said the country must choose between two paths. It can continue to grow into a modern democratic country connected to the global economy or remain a corrupt, impoverished, authoritarian backwater in the shadow of the People's Republic of China. Myanmar's military generals need to realize they will face consequences. The UN Special Rapporteur for Myanmar told VOA. But what's important is that these sanctions have some bite, that they are targeted on the, the generals, that it will make it clear to them that there is a price to pay for, for, for their actions. Human rights groups say the same Myanmar generals who have rounded up all of the country's civilian leaders and are cracking down on any form of dissent are also responsible for past atrocities against Rohingyas and other minorities. Cindy Sain, VOA News. And on Wednesday, Biden stepped up U.S. pressure on the military leaders, outlining his foreign policy goals and announcing new economic sanctions on Myanmar. He also voiced his support for the democratically elected government. Today, 
I again call on the Burmese military to immediately release the democratic political leaders and activists and that they're now detained, including Aung San Suu Kyi, and she is, uh, and also Win Mint, the president. The military must relinquish power it seized and demonstrate respect for the will of the people of Burma, as expressed in their November 8th election. The U.S. government is taking steps to prevent the generals from improperly having access to the $1 billion in Burmese government funds held in the United States. A new executive order enabling us to immediately sanction the military leaders who directed the coup, their business interests, as well as close family members. We're freezing U.S. assets that benefit the Burmese government while maintaining our support for health care, civil society groups, and other areas that benefit the people of Burma directly. For many in Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi is the embodiment of dissent and resistance to the decades under military rule. From 1989 to 2010, she spent nearly 15 years under house arrest. In 1991, Suu Kyi was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. She has been held up as an outstanding example of the power of the powerless. Once released from house arrest in 2010, she became a political figure at home and abroad. Her election to parliament led many countries to drop economic sanctions against Myanmar. By 2012, U.S. President Barack Obama visited Suu Kyi at her home. In 2015, her party swept elections and she was then named state chancellor, making her Myanmar's de facto leader. But since then, the Nobel laureate has been fiercely criticized for her defense of the country's military in carrying out what the U.N. calls the genocide of ethnic Rohingya. The treatment of the Rohingya and the mass killing by Myanmar's military is just the latest flashpoint in a long struggle between civilian and military rule. To better understand that dynamic, I spoke to Derek Mitchell, who served as U.S. Ambassador to Myanmar from 2012 through 2016. We spoke about the larger effects of military coup on the country's movement towards democracy. Ambassador, what provoked this military coup in Myanmar right now? Well, a number of uh, theories as to why it happened now. Um, the most prevalent is that this started with really the commander in chief, Min Aung Hlaing, who has um, the the ability just uh, he and of himself can can take action, um, and the the military will follow. So there's uh, he and Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, the civilian leader, have not gotten along very well. They have a personally bad relationship. It really has not been good for the past five years. And I think he felt humiliated by what the results of the election last November and his inability to find a place for himself uh, after he was slated to retire in July. Um, I think there also have been uh, frustration within some within the military that the NLD, Aung San Suu Kyi's party, has sort of um, uh, outplayed the military. That the military thought this constitution was pretty much controlled, that they had everything in place. Uh, and yet the uh, civilians have been able to outmaneuver them and they may decide to to, uh, to change the rules of the game so that that doesn't happen again. But right now, it really comes down to one person and that is a commander in chief. Is there any indication that that uh, election in November was imperfect? Yes, it was imperfect in the sense that, I mean, the, the election commission, uh, the way they ran the election by most accounts was, was uh, not great. Um, there are concerns, there always are concerns about voter lists and and other processes. But overall, the objective observers, from international observers to domestic monitors, all said that ultimately it, it, the results reflected the will of the people of Myanmar, of Burma. Um, so you're not going to get a perfect election. You're going to have problems. Those problems should be examined. It's reasonable to look at this and see if there are issues that needed to be addressed that, that affected an outcome here or there. But a uh, coup or this kind of action and response is totally disproportionate. Um, and uh, there's no defense for it. In 1988 and again in 2007, uh, when there were protests, uh, people were shot. Um, right now we're seeing people take to the streets, banging on pots and pans. We've seen water cannons from the military. Do you expect that this is going to accelerate? Uh, I'm very worried about it. You have a very proud person in the commander in chief, a very proud institution in the military that will take orders from the top and is not afraid to use force and be brutal. We see, we've seen that throughout history. Um, we've seen that most recently in some of the ethnic areas where they're fighting ethnic groups. Um, and then you have people on the other side, the, the proud people of, of Myanmar, particularly young people going out to the streets 
who are just not going to stand for it. They, they have gotten a taste of freedom and uh, liberty and, and space uh, over the past 10 years, and they're taking to the streets, and they don't seem to want to back down. Uh, so you have sort of irresistible forces on both sides where neither side is willing to back down um, to compromise. Frankly, it's the military, the commander in chief, that needs to take that first step to compromise. Uh, but without that, um, that institution feels its prerogatives are to defend the sovereignty, defend the stability of the country. And once you have uh, some kind of trigger or even just a demonstration somewhere um, that they feel has gotten over the line, the military can take action. You know, I, obviously, I look through this through my American eyes, and when Aung San Suu Kyi first got house arrest this time, is what I read in the papers is because they found walkie-talkies in her home and some other equipment. And I think to myself, I could just uh, go online to Amazon and have them delivered to my house. Am I totally understating what she had, or or, my, or is this? I mean, can you can you put this in a correct context for me? It, it would be a joke if it weren't so serious. I mean, this is this is how the military has no sense of context, has no sense of how they are viewed when they do these types of things. Uh, this is just beyond silly. It's obviously a pretext to try to convict her of something and then keep her out of politics. Finding walkie talkies, I don't know who they're playing to. I don't know what brilliant public relations specialist decided on this one, um, but it is serious because anything they do, any pretext they find, they will uh, they will use uh, as a as a hammer to to hurt somebody and restrict their political space. Um, so they would, they can find anything they want on anyone, but no one believes it. Uh, people want her back. Uh, people of Myanmar want her back in politics. Um, and the military can find whatever pretext they want, but it's um, it's it doesn't work with anyone. Back in 1982, there was a new constitution, and the Rohingya, who had been there for many generations, were not counted as a citizen, although there are 135 ethnic groups or so there. Uh, why does Myanmar um, dislike the Rohingya? Well, it goes back a while. There's lots of misinformation that goes around uh, that that um, these folks are the, the leading column for an international Muslim conspiracy to overwhelm Buddhist countries. When I was there, we would hear about uh, the examples that say, remember Afghanistan or remember Indonesia or remember um, other places, uh, Bengal even, that were majority Buddhist countries years and years, centuries ago, that were overwhelmed by Islam. Uh, and uh, Myanmar, B Burma, thinks of itself as sort of the last bastion of pure Buddhism very proud and they see uh, this this uh, steady movement of Islam across Asia and they're trying to hold firm and they see the Rohingya as somehow a leading edge of that. Uh, it's also a legacy of World War II or even before that of British colonialism where the British would bring in uh, folks from India, particularly Muslims across from uh, now Bangladesh into Rakhine State and they would cross the border openly because there really wasn't a border as part of British colonial uh, a, a British colonial um, uh, period. Um, and so they feel that these people are not true Burmese, that they are migrants, that they are Bengalis, they call them, people from Bangladesh that are not part of the natural fabric. So they see them as not assimilating, um, as a threat, uh, and therefore as uh, something that's not fundamentally part of the fabric of Burma, and therefore something that needs to be uh, suppressed and watched and now to be kicked out and it's very very sad and needs to be remembered that we have to remember that even amidst all the other things going on uh, in that region and in, Bur in burma itself but Aung San Suu Kyi, who is supposedly the woman leading the democracy, uh, actually has defended the military, the Myanmar military, in its ethnic cleansing or genocide of the Rohingya, even going to uh, the international court to defend the actions of the military. So h how is she seen as the de as the democratic leader with that going on? Yeah, and that's, it makes for some cognitive dissonance. I, th dissonance. I think in her mind, probably, that first of all, she couldn't control. She doesn't know precisely what happened there. Uh, and she, she though clearly something terrible happened, and she's recognized that privately. She's recognized that, I think even publicly. I suppose she's trying to split hairs by saying it is not genocide, um, that we were attacked too, and nobody understands that we were attacked. She's trying to make a legal case or a, you know win a kind of 
uh, a balanced argument when she's not speaking up for the true atrocity that occurred. I'm not defending her. I'm trying to explain, I think, what goes through her mind. I think she also felt that that um, she, as the leader of the country, as a de facto, at least civilian leader, trying to defend the country when it is attacked uh, by the international community. Um, but I think, as you say, there's a question I, I imagine people would have, of why do we even defend a country or a person that has defended this atrocity? Um, the fact is what we're trying to defend in, in Burma and Myanmar now is democracy is the will of the people to have a government that reflects them. Without that kind of democracy, uh, the alternative is something like a military dictatorship or a military uh, autocracy. And you'll have instability, you'll have problems uh, in, in the country. Illegitimate government leads to instability. You're seeing that now in the streets. It's not a matter of good or bad governance, it's legitimate governance. And she, whether people like her or not, or dislike her or are indifferent to her, she represents the democratic desires and hopes and dreams of the people of, of Myanmar, of Burma. And therefore, we should be supporting the will of those people. And then if we disagree with certain policies, we go to her or to that party and we, we, uh, uh, we make our case. Myanmar is under an order from the International Court of Justice to protect the more than 600,000 Rohingya Muslims who are still in the country. In 2017, Myanmar's military carried out an ethnic cleansing operation, killing an estimated 24,000 Rohingya and forcing another 700,000 to flee to neighboring Bangladesh. One year later, in 2018, VOA sent me, with a video crew, to the Kutapalong refugee camp, where we were told about rapes, arson, and murder. We also found stories of courage and hope. Here's an excerpt from our documentary, Displaced. There are about one million Rohingyas here in Bangladesh. They're living in very tough conditions with very uncertain futures. Not every Rohingya was able to escape to Bangladesh. Many, numbers unknown, were murdered, slaughtered. The United Nations has identified these vicious acts as ethnic cleansing. You've heard the phrase, never again. But those words ring hollow here. It has happened again to the Rohingyas. They came to one of the groves to our village and then came to our markets and they looted all of the expensive things, and then they set fire. Also, they come into our village and shooting the, everywhere, just firing, like shooting the, like this, uh, on fire. No meat, no discuss, no question, just shooting. When Mohi Bula's village was attacked, he traveled for eight days to reach safety. I have heard that uh, that there was killings, shootings, yes. killings with machete, yes. rapes of women. Yes. Um, do you know Do you know anybody who was killed by machete, shot, or raped? Yeah, a lot of people we we know. When they burn in our uh, villages and the market, that time I saw with my own eyes. Did you see anyone anyone killed with your own eyes? Yes. One of the one of the my villagers also killed on their way. What, running and got shot. Yeah. Yeah. Kasim was a school teacher in his home village where he can trace his family history back at least four generations. My family is also the, one of the brothers who were killed by the Burmese government. So you're taking care of your, your brother's child, oh, yeah. sister in law, your yeah. brother's wife? Yes. How, how do you deal with this? I love him very much. No, I am taking care of him. He is my doctor's child. Why do you think that the Myanmar military did this? The government trying the whole country to be Buddhist. So this is a religious dispute? Religious. It is a religious thing. <laughs> They're trying to be Buddhist country. All will be Buddhist. I heard several stories like this, claiming that the attacks were religiously motivated, Buddhist on Muslim, and calculated to drive out the Rohingya. No government confirms that story, 
But the Rohingya here believe it. I had to leave my children in the midst of firing and chaos. What could I do? So, so she was in her home when the military of Myanmar showed up. Is that right? Yes, that's right. What happened to the village? The village was burned. As the houses were set on fire, a lot of the people could not get out. Some were hacked to death or their bodies were lit on fire. Little children were thrown away violently. How did you get separated from your two children? In Myanmar, our home was attacked suddenly by gunfire. That moment, I escaped through an open door and I grabbed one of my children who was close to me. Soon I saw my whole house was on fire. I do not know what happened to the others. There was no way to know who was shot or who was butchered. I could not find out. I just can't even imagine how, how hard this is. I, I, don't, I almost don't know what to say to you. you know, I'm at a loss for words. My son was five, my daughter seven. What's her name, in case anyone is watching? Shahida. And what is your, boy, what is your son's name? Mahmoud al Hassan. After my trip in 2018, Myanmar's ambassador to the United States, Uan Lin, was our guest on Plugged In. I asked him if he would join me on a trip to Myanmar for a visit to the Rakhine State, home to most of the Rohingya. Would you accompany me to, accompany me to Rakhine State and show me around? I would like to. Uh, because, I mean, I think that's probably one of the yes. best ways to do it. That because would be I, very I've, good. I've not been able to get into the uh, Rakhine State. Sure. Sure. Uh, anyway. I, will, I will recommend you to visit the Rakhine State. Uh -huh. This so, is what we have been doing. In the weeks and months after our conversation, we tried to coordinate the visit, including a letter to the ambassador. We have not received a response. As thousands take to the streets of Myanmar, there are concerns about how this might unfold and its impact on geopolitical tensions across the region. Here's part two of my conversation with former U.S. Ambassador to Myanmar, Derek Mitchell. What's the global impact on this? Where's this going? Um, who are the winners? Is, I mean, is, do they up their uh, relationship with China? Where does this head? I don't know that anybody's a winner in this. I mean, the Chinese, in an interesting way, had a had a modus vivendi, had a, a, a fine relationship with the NLD and with Aung San Suu Kyi, in part because of the way the West and others had uh, address the Rohingya crisis by isolating and becoming somewhat alienated from the government for good reason. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing, but the uh, the trust between the NLD government and the West had uh, declined in the last since the Rohingya crisis um, and uh, or the, the violence against the Rohingya in 2017. Uh, and the Chinese came in and took advantage of that. Uh, this could play to their benefit by causing more isolation. Uh, of the country by uh, the democratic um, uh, world. But um, you know, I don't know that there are any winners. I think uh, even for China, this can create more instability on their border. Uh, it can create more difficult conditions for its investment. The people of the country may decide it wants to uh, turn against China. There's no love lost for, uh, between the people of, of Burma and the Chinese, uh, and it exposes them more. Um, to to that kind of anger. So I'm not sure anybody wins. The people don't win. I don't know that the military wins. Maybe Min Aung Lang feels he wins because he can protect himself and his family. But ultimately, um, he will not go down in history very well. And I'm not sure it helps the country to uh, put them through this at this moment in a pandemic and when there's so many other needs uh, for the country to come together uh, to, to, uh, to uh, solve uh, problems. Does the world need to worry about any nuclear weapons aspirations or any relationship with DPRK with North Korea? Interesting question. I mean, that's something I worked on when I was there uh, quietly because there was a history of a close relationship between Burma and the North and North Korea, DPRK. Uh, there were questions about nuclear capabilities. I, I know of none. Uh, even then, we didn't see evidence of that. We saw evidence of other things, of, of other weapons transfers that were contrary to international law. And we tried to shut that down and we made progress. I haven't been privy to intelligence in the past five years to know if that has been revived, but I would be surprised if it had. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was still some 
contact between the two. I certainly hope not. And that also creates uh, security problems for all of us. Does the Myanmar military have any external financing from any other countries? Well, they get financing. They've been getting financing from the World Bank and IMF and uh, and China and others. Uh, so, uh, yes, they, they've opened up their economy and um, and sought help from any anyone who would help them. And we all had an interest in helping them uh, because, again, this was a democratic moment, a, a window, first time in 60 years that there was a legitimate government that was a desire of the people, this civilian government. Uh, and I think most wanted to see that government succeed and to see Myanmar get back on its feet. It's a very important place and a very important location at the crossroads of East Asia and South Asia, both quite dynamic regions. Uh, and yet this place uh, in Myanmar has so much potential, so many natural resources, uh, a remarkable population that has been kept down, but it has sort of the DNA of a highly developed country. So um, trying to, to realize its potential would provide yet another engine of growth and, and prosperity and development in Asia um, but again, this coup, I think, sets that back uh, and sets that off course, which makes things uh, quite disappointing. Any thought to why there's such public outrage, even in the media and the government, about the Chinese and their treatment of the Uyghur, yet there has been almost silence as to the treatment uh, by Myanmar military, Myanmar towards the Rohingya? Uh, there's been, well, there was a lot of attention to the Rohingya for a while, but it's true. It has sort of uh, fallen into the shadows uh, of late, and that's unfortunate. I hope there's more attention again, not just to what the military did to them, but but also just to these these people themselves who need help. They need sustenance. They need hope. They need their dignity and their humanity. Um, but, um, you know, there are sanctions on the military, um, but um, I, I, don't, I can't say why there's you know, in, in any regard, why one issue gets attention over another. I imagine the Uyghurs get attention in part because uh, it's China, and there's a lot of attention to the rise of China um, and the fact of Chinese human rights abuses uh, in Hong Kong as well as in in, um, in, uh, in, in Uyghur areas. So um, they both deserve attention because they're both horrible uh, situations. Um, look into your imaginary crystal ball. If you and I are having this conversation six months from now, what do you think we'd be talking about about Myanmar? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I know what I hope. I don't know what I ought to see. I, um, you know, most, I really do hope, I, I, I don't want to anticipate anything. I really do hope the military, uh, beyond the commander in chief, but hopefully including the commander in chief, have decided this, they're on the wrong track. Um, at, at worst, I mean, if they continue on this path, they will not get the support of the international community. The people will not accept this. Um, it will hold the country back. Um, it will divide things and it will not lead to anything good. Uh, I do hope that by six months, there's some dialogue uh, between the democratic forces, the people and the military to try to set this right. Um, but, um, you know, many people are quite pessimistic that the military, not they've said they will give up this is only one year state of emergency. Very few people believe that. Uh, very few people say they're going to have another election because another election will simply re uh, result in the same result that has occurred since 1990. In every credible election, the NLD has won big. Uh, the same result, in fact. What happened in November was almost the same result as what happened in 2015, which was the same in 1990. There's a consistency. Will the military allow that to happen again? Uh, it's hard to believe that they would do that. Uh, because they know, they must know, they are not popular. They are not wanted in government. They are not wanted in politics. Um, so I very much hope the international community will come together, that maybe they won't, don't do exactly the same things, but there is some cost to what has occurred here, and that the military sees that they're on the wrong track, wrong track and reverse themselves. Ambassador, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. That's all the time we have for now. My thanks to Ambassador Derek Mitchell. Stay up to date at voenews.com and follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in.